Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us. We are sorry for the late start. We are um, having a little bit of technical difficulty with one of our presenters um, getting through to the um, system. So uh, worst case scenario is we may have him call in and we'll have him speak through his speaker um, to us all, uh, but um, more to come on that. Uh, so today, uh, we've asked uh, several of your colleagues to really speak with us regarding their experiences converting to having to do remote testing in this current uh, COVID in environment. And so with us today, um, who will hopefully get patched in is Dr. Uh, Richard Delmonico, who is the Director of Neuropsychology at the Kaiser Foundation up in Northern California. We also have Dr. Uh, uh, Alicia uh, De Huala Gottlieb, who is uh, a developmental pediatric psychiatrist who works in the Los Angeles area. We also have Dr. Mitch Klonsky, uh, who is a neuropsychologist in group practice, who, um, um, Mitch, where are you, where are you um, working? Springfield, Massachusetts, Springfield. in the western part of the state. Great, yeah. thank you. And and then Dr. Randy Coleman as well, who is a neuropsychologist in group practice. And uh, Dr. Coleman, you are uh, practicing where? Rhode Island. Rhode Island. Thank you. So when um, uh, we were preparing this, we uh, really wanted to kind of hit on some three goals today that uh, hopefully people will walk away with from this presentation. So we've asked the presenters to share their experiences and what they've learned along the way in adjusting to testing, we, what we like to call ROSA, which is remote on-screen administration or hybrids of that, uh, in response to the social distancing requirements that have been brought about by the uh, response to the COVID pandemic. So the goal is that this presentation is designed to be interactive between the panelists as they discuss a range of challenges from institutional adjustments they've had to make uh, to their workflow. Uh, also, the technology issues and hurdles that they've had to uh, grapple with and adapt to. Uh, also, issues around protecting uh, personal health information, how to set up remote testing, and special populations they may be working with, for example, older populations or younger populations or those who may have uh, some impairments that make the remote testing even more challenging. The use of proctors, the uh, constraints on use of manipulatives in a uh, remote environment and other topics as well. So hopefully you will leave today's presentation with a greater awareness of some of the challenges and also some of the solutions that have been developed by your colleagues who have and are continuing to adapt their practice activity in order to serve the needs of the clients that they serve and hopefully the ones that you serve as well as you roll these ideas out uh, uh, and the impact on their business and the business models and uh, the institutions with uh, whom they work. So in preparation, um, I, I asked the panelists to just give us a quick uh, uh, introduction of who they are before we roll into some of the deeper content. And uh, Dr. Delmonico, oops, Dr. Delmonico is not available right now, but so we'll go ahead and start with uh, Dr. Gottlieb. Yes, hi. Um, I am a, a trained pediatrician and a, and a child psychiatrist, and I work, um, was at UCLA um, and New York Presbyterian for about 20 years, and now I'm solely private practice in Santa Monica, California. I um, test children from birth, um, through up to age 18. I don't see adults, but a lot of my practice is zero to six year olds. And so, of course, that creates a certain amount of challenges when you're trying to create hybrid models um, for testing. But um, I started remote testing, I think, the day after we here in California went, went into a lockdown or shutdown. And so um, I have been, I think since, since March 12th, I believe, uh, whenever it became available, I started um, shortly after that, I just started doing a remote testing. And then once I felt a little bit comf more comfortable, I, I ventured out and created more of a hybrid model for, for the younger children. And so um, it's been a great, interesting experience. And I think looking ahead, it will, I'll be interested to kind of understand how the practice will change and what actually people responded well to and what they want to keep in terms of these now new hybrid models. So it's been great. a really great experience, yeah. Great, thank you, Dr. Gottlieb. And Dr. Sure. Klonsky, would you like to go next? Hi, I'm Mitch Klonsky. I'm in private practice in Western Massachusetts. 
I have a group practice with a variety of other people, which you'll see on the slides. Hopefully that won't be TMI, but I've tried to go through some depth as to how we run the practice and basically the whole scenario, the chronology from how we started out previously to what we've morphed into at this point. So I'll save that, but we'll go through the slide presentation. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Klonsky. And Dr. Coleman? Hi, I'm Randy Coleman. Uh, I'm a clinical psychologist in Rhode Island uh, in private practice. I'm also the uh, founder of Learning Works for Kids, which happens to be an online learning program for teaching executive functioning skills. So this has been sort of an opportune time for me to put the method into that. And I've always been interested in uh, technology when it comes to assessment, when it comes to treatment and those kinds of things. So in some ways, all these things happening will kind of open some doors for me to, to explore. So I'm kind of interested to talk a little bit about that and uh, hopefully can inspire people to want to use those technologies. Great. So I'm going to say a few words about Dr. Delmonico, and hopefully he'll be able to patch in uh, later. Uh, uh, so Dr. Delmonico is the head of neuropsychology at the Kaiser Foundation, as I mentioned, in Northern California, and has responsibility for overseeing uh, multiple uh, uh, clinics and treatment sites in the Northern California region, really ranging from San Jose to Sacramento um, um, up to the California Oregon border. And uh, I've had the, uh, the pleasure of working with Dr. Delmonico for a number of years as we've uh, worked collaboratively with Kaiser to really help them transition to um, the, the digital world. Um, and, uh, and if, if he's not able to get on, on the call today, I will share with some of the experiences that we've collectively been able to have together and some of the materials he sent. Um, so with that, I want to introduce our, our, our presenting, I mean, excuse me, our, our uh, attending audience, some of the initial questions I posed to our presenters to get us started uh, as they were looking at uh, what they wanted to bring in today. So the first thing I asked them was to consider is what was their experience providing remote assessment in a pre versus current COVID environment? Uh, how have they been able to convert an assessment challenge into a success in their practice or place of work? And what are some of the top things that they didn't know going into this that they've learned? What have their main sources of support been as they've attempted to adjust to this new way of practice? What types of pressures have they experienced in adapting to this? For example, face-to-face, -face, financial, staffing, so on, and how have they dealt with those pressures? And then finally, uh, what do they see as similarities and differences during remote testing administration with adults, older adults, and children? So after each of the, uh, the, the presenters uh, talk about what they, um, kind of what their experiences and adaptations are, um, I will uh, go ahead and return to some of these questions. Uh, and then finally, just uh, we also had audience questions that uh, we wanted to make sure that we were considering as well. Um, so maybe they could comment, the presenters were asked to comment on hybrid administration and how they structure that administration, remote face-to-face, uh, -face, um, where they, they use uh, technological materials such as iPads or other things, uh, manipulatives and so on. Uh, what steps would be helpful in training a caregiver to be a facilitator if they do on-site remote administration of some of the tools such as the WISCs and so on? Uh, what has been their experience of third parties not accepting online testing due to standardization and other issues and so on. So I'm going to go ahead and for the sake of time, um, I'm going to uh, jump over to the first set of slides. And I think this is um, uh, for Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Coleman. We'll go ahead and start with you. Okay. Take it away. Dr. Coleman, are you there? <laughs> Uh-oh. I'm sorry, I'm here. I just, I just, I, I turned off my, I muted myself. So can you see oh, my okay. slides? <laughs> um, I, I have them up. Um, I think you should be able to control the advance, but if you can't, just let me know and I will do it. Okay, so I can control the advance with the, okay. Yep, perfect. Perfect, okay. So, uh, Essentially, I, I'll, I'll give you just a five or 10 minute overview of, of what our experience has been with doing remote testing. Uh, as I said in, in introducing myself, uh, this is almost sort of a, an opportunity for me because I've been very involved with ways of using technology to help kids learn executive functioning, social emotional learning skills for many years. 
and never having done testing with that, but the idea of using technology as a tool for, for assessment and for treatment was it's pretty attractive to me. So when all this happened, I think I, I encountered probably what everybody else did, which was a lot of the concerns about ethical issues and evidence-based concerns. I mean, what's, you know, does this work? Is this okay? And I was very reluctant. I didn't just jump into this. I mean, it was probably, probably I'm going to guess four or five, six weeks at least, maybe more before I jumped into it. Uh, Rhode Island has a, a very active listserv for the Rhode Island Psychological Association. I got a lot of opinions there. I went to a number of the webinars that were uh, that were offered. I wanted to just learn as much as I could about it. Uh, I wasn't as much concerned about some of the issues around high stakes testing and, and some of those validity issues in terms of going to court and things like that. But I wanted to make sure that it made sense. Um, one of the things that happened to me very quickly after COVID came and we were starting to do this is I had probably about 10 or 15 testing reviews that I hadn't completed yet. I had fit, finished writing up my testing uh, and wanted to figure out a way to complete those those uh, evaluations and provide the testing review. So I started doing that online. And that turned out to be a great experience, actually. Now, part of that is that I've been working towards having uh, electronic versions of our reports for many years. In fact, I'd be happy to share this with you. If you want to just go on to our, you can see the South County Child and Family Consultants uh, logo there, go to SouthCountyChildAndFamily.com. And look at the bottom. Is on, on the on the foot of there's a, a, a model test report, and, built, and so we built in all these things to make these test reports electronic. So you can click on things to say, how do you understand the statistics in the neuropsychological test? What is the verbal comprehension index? Mean? So you can click on probably 30 or 40 things built into every single report. So the reports were actually made to be shared electronically. And what I also began to realize is that. When I could do this, I could also share other information more readily than I sometimes can in my office. So, so I had some of my uh, young people. And by the way, my, my biggest recommendation, if you're going to be doing this and you haven't done any of these kinds of things yet, is to get some young people in your office who can help you with the technology. I had some of my students uh, take screenshots uh, and scan in, like, for example, pages from the WIST, you know, the, the, the sh showing the... Uh, subtest scores and, sh and showing the the uh, index scores. The same thing for other kinds of graphs that, that I could share readily. And I could share those very easily on Zoom. So I could be talking about something, switch back to that. And in many ways, the families really benefited from that. They actually could see it. I could kind of show them, highlight what I wanted to see. Um, I, I, just, I just actually found that that was a, a really good thing. And I'm planning on doing this after all as well. Another thing that happened for me, again, personally, was that I've been very interested in, in developing online programs for teaching kids executive functioning skills. So at the same time, I had a little extra time, and our practice sort of began developing a, a variety of short of online um, gaming programs. Essentially, we were using popular games to teach executive functioning skills. There's a, there's a platform called OutSchool that does uh, has a, a huge batch of of teachers who are available to teach online. And what we're doing is we're, we're, do, we're using this to teach executive functioning skills. So we developed our, our stuff to do online, which was great. So, let's see. so uh, what works online? Uh, so I started thinking a little bit about that as I began to feel more comfortable with it. I began asking what kinds of things could we do online effectively in terms of testing? But also we started to move towards doing as many things as that we could possibly do that parents could complete remotely at home. So in the past, we would give parents task threes in the office, and they would bring them back to us. We would send them out to teachers. Now we started e emailing those. We started doing that with MMPIs. Uh, we recently purchased the Brown Executive Function Attention Scale. We haven't yet begun using it yet, but partly because I got that because I knew we could do that remotely. Um, we also took some of our own questionnaires that we used in the office. We developed some of our own screening devices that we've used on our websites. We're looking at things like looking at executive functioning skills that we're able to, we've, we've actually done quite a bit of research on it. We've actually got a, a screening device on, on slow processing speed that we have presented on a few times as well. So we took those things that we developed in our office and again, put them online, made them available for the patients to fill out, and then they could just submit those to us. So again, uh, I, I, the, the, getting these things on, 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 online was, was my savvy students. 
not not so much not so much me. So you know, we did that, uh, and, it, and 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 those things have turned out to be really good. So, for example, before a patient comes in now, they they remotely fill out our our, our what we call our background information. Contract. All this information about their families it comes in. Sometimes, as you know. Uh, families can come into an office or individuals can come into an office. You could send them some paperwork. They never finish it. We know if it's not finished and we bug them. We can, we, can, we can check on that and we can let them know. The next one I want to go is, so how, when, and who could be tested online? So uh, unfortunately, uh, one of my first questions about this is we mostly deal with health insurance uh, in, our, in our practice in Rhode Island. So would the insurers pay? Well, after many phone conversations and, and many consultations with my colleagues uh, on the Rhode Island, in the Rhode, Rhode Island Psychological Association, it turns out that they're paying okay. They're, they're pretty much doing that. Then the next step was we work with kids. Uh, essentially, we'll see kids anywhere from three through college age. What happens with working with kids? And so what we found out is that the younger kids are very difficult to evaluate remotely. Uh, and, and we, for the most part, do not do any remote evaluations of kids under seven, and really eight or nine. If it's a particularly mature seven-year-old, we, we'll do some some work in the office and some and some um, remotely. Uh, what happens is, and this is some of our experiences, is that the younger kids oftentimes need that face-to-face -face, uh, involvement in order to follow directions, or to, maybe maybe even more importantly, to let us know when they don't understand. Uh, we, we, we've used the EBT2, the PWP children vocabulary test four, and sometimes we'll ask them to tell us the number or the letter of something as opposed to pointing something because it's much more difficult to see the pointing. And sometimes the younger kids really even struggle with that, so we're very careful about that. Another thing that we've done, and this has already been brought up a little bit, which is how do you involve the parents and what do you do? So we've developed a, a couple of uh, emails, essentially, kind of instructional sets for parents about what their role is in the remote remote evaluation. So I've got a short one and a long one. If anybody's interested, you can email me. Uh, I'd be happy to share them with you. Uh, one of them is, is probably too long to send out to parents. We have a shorter one that we send, but the other, but the longer one has a lot of detailed instruction about what they can do. Concern, there's you know there's certainly concerns that we've seen about privacy, home settings. Uh, one of the one of the difficulties we've seen sometimes with the older kids is that the older kids are uh, they're very busy texting, they're doing other things. One of, one, of, one of our kids was playing with this kitten, very cute, but not very helpful for testing. So what we found is that you really have to jump in right away, say something to them about that. And at times you need to say something about parents. Although what I have found for most parents is they want to help their kids, but if you send them something beforehand, they do they can do a pretty good job of monitoring them. I also thought that that we, that we might be able to do some things better online versus in the office. And one of the things that I have found to be difficult has to do with certain types of verbal tasks that require precise articulation. So uh, I, I found that we could do some memory tasks online, but certain ones where the kids have to listen very carefully and have to have a great connection, and I have to be able to hear them really well, such as like the wordless interference test on, on the NEPC is a really difficult thing. Um, you and you end up sort of finding that sometimes the kids will say, "I didn't hear you." And in the office, you might be reluctant to repeat yourself if you felt as if the kid just wasn't attending, or if it was in your judgment that that they were just trying to hear it for a second time. It's a lot more difficult doing it this way. Uh, let's see. So. When the digital versions of the major test came up, that was like a godsend. It was like, wow, we can do some of this stuff. It was really great. And uh, uh, and, and I know I, I, I don't want to uh, be too patronizing, but Kirsten did a pretty good job in getting that stuff together. I, I was I was really appreciative of that. So so at some point, we returned to the office. And for, and for me, I think it was July sixth or seventh, and. I found out it was not a panacea. It took me about a week, and I said, this is not working very well. Uh, I, you could just look at the kids. A lot of them were so anxious, and, not, and probably anxious if they're seeing me for the first time, but just anxious about wearing a mask and coming in there. Um, I, you, know, I, you know, I had a, 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 
a screen to put between me and the kids. I just couldn't use that very well. You know, we 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 kind of developed some new rituals. Uh, I mean, every kid that comes in, we're doing hand sanitizers together and cleaning our hands and wiping off the table because it's all over the all over the testing table that we use. Um, mask, and it wasn't just the kids that didn't like the mask. I didn't. I don't like the masks as well. The younger kids just can't wear them. Uh, you know, I find you can kind of change them. You can, you know, if you if you if you're doing a verbal task and you want to make sure the person understands, you have got to pull the mask away from your mouth and, and speak it clearly and much slower than I'm speaking right now as you can. So you really have to, to deal with that. And then if you're, if you're aging, I'll, I'll describe myself as aging at this point, and my hearing is pretty good, but if you're aging and you also have an air conditioner on to blow air around and the kids are speaking through a mask, sometimes it's not so easy to hear what they're saying. Uh, so that's another thing that, that you know, I became very aware of and, and said, you know, I'm not sure how great this is doing at the office. So really essentially after a week i said this is not particularly working very well for me and so we've moved real quickly to this hybrid model what i'm doing now is i'm having essentially an extended intake so rather than meeting with family for an hour i meet with them for an hour and a half when i say an hour i probably needed 45 50 minutes i'm spending basically an hour and a half seeing the family and then doing the testing that i need to do with the kid and a little bit more to get it done then but that's so i'm having one face-to-face -face contact with family. We take a picture of the family, which helps me to remember them when I'm going to see them later online. I also have some technicians helping with testing, and they're essentially doing the same thing. For the most part, they're doing an hour to an hour and a half of testing in the office and about two hours of testing outside of the office. I also then see the child one more time online and do just a few tests. It's, it's really more that the second testing is to, is to do you know, maybe 20, 30 minutes of testing at most, but really just to kind of reacquaint myself with the, with the kid, getting to know them. Uh, and we're continuing to do our testing reviews online. I just I just began doing those again uh, this week, and I think that's going to be something that, like I said, I'll, I hope I'll hold down to. I'm more than happy to share how we do that. We can we create patient files that, that make it really pretty easy to do. And so far, like, so for example, this week I had a mom, a dad, and a stepdad uh, stepdad was at work, mom and the mom and dad divorced. So they were in three separate places. It was beautiful. All three of them could be there. They happened to live an hour away from, from my office. And, and uh, most of the audience is not from Rhode Island, but Rhode Island is not even an hour. You can't drive for an hour. Anybody who drives in Rhode Island for more than 15 or 20 minutes feels like they're going cross country. So for this family, this was wonderful that they could do that. And it worked out great. So that's about what I want to share. Pat, you want to come back in? Yeah. Sorry, I was on. Sorry, guys, I was on mute. So let me um, just um, queue up our next uh, presenter. Um, that'll be oh. Dr. That'll be Dr. I mean, Dr. Um, sorry, I have Dr. Delmonico as well on the line, uh, Klonowski. And let me go ahead. I'm not sure what people are okay. Here sure we go. Are. There you go, Dr. McClos uh, Klonowski. Why don't you go ahead and take it away, real quick? Okay. So let me see if I can pull this up. And hopefully everyone can see this. So this is technology, technology enhanced evaluation. Okay, next here. So my practice is called Neuropsychology Associates. We are an outpatient practice. And when I hear people talk about testing with children, I am in awe because we do adults and geriatrics down to about age 16 now. And I can't imagine going lower just because it is such a difficult kind of population. Go back here a little bit. We've been in operation since 1987. We primarily see people with dementia, MCI, we do a variety of ADHD evaluations, and we see a number of concussions, although our concussions are usually from auto accidents and other kinds of trauma as opposed to sports. And then we see the round of uh, you know, different kinds of neurological conditions because we get referrals from neurologists. We're in a rather large office suite that contains eight clinician offices back in the day with four testing labs, both here and one in a separate building. And we use what I call a coordinated team model of testing. So I have this team of 
people who work and basically carry me. These are myself, my other part-time neuropsychologist, Dr. Tracy Fieldwood Rocha, three of our postdocs, a master's level clinician, some psychometricians, and the real experts here, which are administrative specialists, because without them, we could not do this. This is a schematic of how we've set up our primary site before the COVID epidemic. A variety of blue rectangles representing clinician offices and the red rectangles representing the laboratories. Across town, we have a separate site where we originally had a combined clinician and testing lab. Before we'd have to travel back and forth, we do three different kinds of levels of evaluations. First one is, whoops, skip it back on me. Uh, what we call comprehensive neuropsych evaluation, which is about five to six hours of face-to-face, -face, more limited four to five hours, and a shorter neurobehavioral status exam of only two to three hours. Very busy practice pre-COVID. We did 1,200 evaluations per year over the last several years. All of them are face-to-face, -face, paper and pencil, talking back and forth, exchanging materials, and doing some computerized tests. And then, of course, all hell broke loose. At the end of March, we closed the practice in advance of the pandemic, and remained closed for seven weeks. Then the question became very much how to adapt to the new realities. First option was we refit our labs. So now we start putting everybody in masks, and as you just heard, that has its own problems as to how many hours a day can anyone wear a mask, how well can you hear each other, and perhaps even more importantly, how do you read facial expression? And we said, well, we'll also put a plastic or plexiglass shield between us. So you put the hole up in the middle so you can hear better, or the hole at the bottom so you can pass things back and forth. Does it have to go up to the ceiling? There's a lot of unanswered questions about how you handle materials. And I guess more importantly, how long do you really want to share the same air as another person in a small lab? Our labs were built for efficiency. The smaller the lab, the more labs you can have, the more testing you can do. It doesn't work so well in the post-COVID world. So then we were thought about distance testing. This seemed like a good idea initially, but then we had to figure out which platform to use and then we started trying them out and finding out even in our own setting where we did a couple of feedbacks and things with people we had tested pre previously, that there were dropped sessions, that there was slow video response. And on time tests, things would freeze. Also, I was very concerned about how we deal with the privacy of people coming in and out of someone's household. How do you deal with all of the distractions? And what should we do with coaches? We like to help out mom or dad, helping them to refresh their memory. There's also the issue of how do you get the materials to them, and then how do you get them back without them being altered or copied? So we had a lot of questions that were difficult to answer and decided to create a new model. In this model, everyone still comes into the office, pretty much. Occasionally, we work from home as a clinician. But by and large, we have all our patients, all our clinicians in the office, but not interacting with each other directly. We have three goals for this model. Number one, safety first. Number two, better control of the technology. And three, we needed to preserve the validity of the testing and using a mix of traditional methods and also some new methods for a digital generation. Let's talk about safety. We decided to digitize our questionnaires or send our forms out to people. So some of them are filled out online and others they receive through the mail. We set up plastic shields between our front desk and our patients when they check in. We do pre-appointment screening for patient health and any recent travel. Everybody gets a temperature check when they arrive. Everybody wears masks in all shared areas we try to limit how many people wait in our waiting room and how long they wait there. We also put in some enhanced sanitizing kinds of procedures. And when the staff are interacting with the patients, they not only wear masks, but they wear face shields and gloves, and everybody does 
hand sanitizing. We then needed to work on the technology end of things. So this was one of the more daunting things at a time when it was difficult to get some of the technology. We had to go out on a searching mission to get computers for all of our labs and our offices that were up to date and fast, some large screen monitors and webcams, which were nearly impossible to get for quite a while. We decided to equip our labs with two cameras, one to look at the patients and one to look at the tabletop so we could see how they were working on things while they were working. We also needed to set up microphones and higher end speakers so that the patients could hear what we were saying. We, on the other end, used headsets to allow us for hands-free operation. We explored a number of different modalities, eventually ended up with Zoom as our platform, got the HIPAA compliant version, and set up Zoom rooms with licenses for each of the labs and each of our clinicians so we could quickly move back and forth. We also discovered that our high-speed internet was not as fast as we thought. So we had to upgrade this and make sure that it was giving us the proper quality. It says here's voice and sound, but it really means voice and picture. So here's the schematic of what our place looks like. We have all the blue areas being the labs. We've now changed these by connecting them all to Zoom. We took away one lab, chained the lab in an office in the gold area down at the feedback rooms where we could bring people in to talk about their test results if we were not doing that with them at home. We still do a number of you know, people technologically savvy. We can do the feedbacks with them while they're still at home. We also set it up so that Dr. Phelan can work from her office about an hour away. And if I want to, I can also work from my home office at times. So here's what our labs look like. One of my front desk people, we see up here the switchable dual webcams both the face view and one that looks down on the paper. We've got larger than monitors. These are actually gaming monitors and directional mic with bigger speakers. Here on my end of this, I've got the headset, one camera, monitor, and of course, the ubiquitous coffee cup. <laughs> and we set up our feedback rooms. I thought I'd label the coffee cup that way everyone would recognize it. Uh, we set these up so we can bring in whole families who sit around together and can hear what we have to say about how their loved one did on the testing. We then needed to manage the traditional materials. Ordinarily, you know, you pass them back and forth, so you give people just what they need at the time they need it. Now there's nobody in the room with the patient. So we first laminated the paper that we were going to use repeatedly and on the other forms that are single use forms, we put all of them into different color coded folders. So instead of handing a trail making to a person, we would say, open the red folder, pull out the page, and that's what you're gonna work on in front of you. We also wanted to do something to secure our stimuli after they were used. So we created this vertical ballot box where we have the patients slip the folders with the coverings back inside when they're done. So this clears the area, does reduce, reduces distractions, but also prevents the patients from going back and revising or reviewing what they previously drew or wrote. We also created some on-screen stimuli and scanned in some things from existing stimuli so we could present them using the screen share feature. This allowed us to clearly present information, didn't require anyone to touch anybody else. We could control the presentation rate and even embed a demonstration video and sound into a slide so that it would help clarify what the instructions were. Here's an example of a test we developed called the shopping list test. It's basically a 12 item learning test for grocery store shopping lists. And here's how usually in the past, we would simply have a folder where we would show this test items to people. But now we present these on a screen. And as you should be able to see, the good quality and patients are able to see these quite easily without us having to be in the same room as they are. 
Plus, when we get to the end of the test, we're then able to give the instructions for what we want them to do and eliminate some of the confusion. So we've got some benefits for this model, we believe. First of all, safety, no direct contact. Secondly, it's fairly comfortable. We're able to keep our masks off, as are the patients. They always sigh with relief when they get to take their masks off. There's a greater clarity of speech and also rapport building. Our labs and all materials are sanitized between all patients. We're also able to manage the setting. Patients get thirsty, patients get hungry. We've traditionally always given them snacks or beverages. We still do that. We avoid the interruptions in the outside coaching. If someone melts down during testing, we can have someone right there. And we control the connectivity. Fewer drop calls, fewer problems, because it's all connect contained within our own lab. We also think that we have a pretty valid method of administration. And we see people, we often see a lot of people who repeat testing. We find very similar patterns, very similar levels of responses, both in this model and in our previous face-to-face -face model. It allows us to really take a look at their body language, which is very helpful for people with Parkinson's disease, other kinds of movement disorders. We can look at their facial expression. We can give a lot of tests traditionally. We're also able to switch back and forth and using a high-end Logitech Rio camera, we can zoom and pan on the desk, which allows us really to see everything that's going on while it's going on. Our clinicians get to do what they've always done, they record things on paper, collect the materials afterwards, and we can maintain the security of the tests. It also allows some of us to work from home at times, as long as we've got good support people on site. We can theoretically also recruit clinicians from other parts of the state. And because the patients are in the office, we're able to use the same billing codes it's the same place of service. They're here in the office. Hmm. There are some drawbacks. Hearing impairment becomes a difficulty even with the speakers for some elderly patients. On the other hand, we're able to identify some hearing losses that before we probably just adjusted to by speaking louder. And now with the recent research showing that hearing loss is a causal uh, kind of factor in memory loss this allows us to intervene and advise people to get hearing tests and to potentially be fitted with hearing aids before that we might have missed that data. It's not quite the real thing. It's a little bit artificial, at least at first, but people get used to it pretty easily. There is some more cumbersome instructions. We find the trail making test particularly difficult because ordinarily you stop someone where they make a mistake and you correct it. Now we have to compensate for that. And initially, at least, we found test manufacturers were not as fast as we were in terms of getting the digital materials that we needed. Our clinicians have to be technologically competent. And if you have a failure in your own office with your platform or your internet, you live by the Zoom and you die by the Zoom. We had a close up one afternoon when we simply lost our internet connection because it went out for the whole area and we couldn't restore it. Initially, we saw some clinician fatigue. People were more tired at the end of the day doing it this way, but that's improving. But there's about a 20% loss of our previous volume, simply because we can't fix people quite as tightly as we used to before. And then there's the initial and continuing startup costs. We've got screens and computers and cameras, speakers and microphones, We've got monthly licensing fees, and the question is, do you buy new materials? And how do they come in? Should they be free if you've already purchased the existing materials? That should be an interesting discussion. On balance, however, we think this is a good enough model to adapt to a bad enough situation. We think it will keep us open and financially intact until the pandemic eases. And when we're able to sit across from each other again, we're gonna be able to tear it all down reallocate our computers and not really incur much in the way of cost at that point. It may also allow us to expand. We may be able to set up a rural testing hub. We may be able to bring in 
uh, urban testing hub where previously it's a very underserved area. And you may be able to use clinicians with special skills or languages or cultural familiarity. If I'm here in Springfield and I got somebody who speaks Mandarin, I may be able to recruit somebody out of Boston, for example, who's a Mandarin speaker, but otherwise I could never get my patient to see. So we think this is an adaptation to a pandemic that's created a lot of challenges. But as they say, in any challenge to any organism, the act of adapting often improves that organism and its chances for survival. So I believe that by adapting our traditional model of assessment, we may make our profession actually more relevant, more accessible, and more easily integrated into medical organizations. And that's all. All righty. Well, thank you very much for uh, your overview and sharing your experience, Dr. Klyonsky. Um, I'm going to go ahead and now uh, hand over the reins to um, Dr. Gottlieb. And um, if you could please share with us your experiences and then uh, following that, we will begin opening it up for uh, a broader discussion amongst each other and in our participants. Go ahead. Yeah, certainly, yeah, certainly. thank you. Um, so my office is actually um, located in Santa Monica and is shared by five physicians, uh, the other four of whom are pediatricians. So it was very unique uh, at the beginning of the pandemic because um, I would be walking into an office, in my office, with a lot of potentially sick children in that office. So it, it limited me in terms of my ability to use my office initially and quite a bit through the pandemic. We've also worked hard in our office to um, to convert some space, one of which was my beautiful big space where I did a lot of my testing, where I had a separate entrance into kind of a sick room. And so, and we do a lot of COVID testing. So it was a little bit more of a complex system for me. So as a result, I really started early and worked hard to develop a way to test remotely it, because I, um, was not feeling as confident using my own office, actually, um, for the safety of my, my patients. Um, so I started um, remote testing pretty quickly and then, and then adopted an, a hybrid as well pretty quickly. And I would say where I've, been, at where I've landed is more in that hybrid model. Um, and what that looks like, initially, prior to the pandemic, I would do an intake, an hour and a half. Uh, I would do a school observation as my next step and then I would do testing in my office and then feedback in my office with the families. Um, so I quickly, obviously, no school visits were happening. I just immediately adopted intake and feedback with parents uh, remotely. I used Zoom, HIPAA compliant Zoom. I've always used it. I used Doxy for a minute and I didn't feel um, that it was as user friendly. I think it's maybe changed, but I know there were some questions about other platforms. So I used HIPAA compliant. Um, <laughs> from the beginning and um, and for the children who were about six and a half and up um, I used primarily everything I could do remotely I did remote testing so that you know whatever it was the whisk or the Wyatt or um, I used other rating measures very good ones the brown EFA um, the Vineland so there was a lot that became available pretty quickly um, online for remote administration. And so I incorporated as much as I could and saw first, initially first those children in that age group, six and a half and up remotely. And I did you know, mostly remote testing. The littler ones, I held off for just a bit of time to see um, how the pandemic was running. In California here in, L in LA County, we were doing terribly um, and continue not to do so well. And then we of course have uh, smoke on top of it. So we're, it's a little complicated right here in LA. So I developed a hybrid model where I would meet with parents um, on Zoom. Everyone loves it. I think it works beautifully. Um, I've been even doing, because I'm a child psychiatrist, I do other types of work other than testing. So I do uh, parenting, I do child therapy, um, medication management. So I do a lot of other work and all of that has worked pretty nicely 
for the most part. I won't, I won't get into the therapy with young kids on Zoom. <laughs> That's not the purpose <laughs> of this uh, discussion. But for the most part, a lot, all my work was done on Zoom unless I needed to do face-to-face. And that was my, that's simply been my hybrid model. The, the things that could be done um, through the remote platforms and, um, you know, I know that Pearson has been building more and more, which has been great. And I've utilized those. And then if I need to go out to see a child, and that would be if I needed to do uh, a younger child to do a WIPSI or to do a NEPSI, if I wanted to do things um, that were either required manipulatives or not available um, through, um, through remote administration, then I would go out to um, people's homes. So I do a lot of house calls. I did a lot of house calls before. So this is not a unique unique for my practice. Um, a lot of my family preferred that I come to them rather than they come to the office. So um, what I, I think it's certainly diminished my efficiency because I'm driving around. But, um, but I do take my testing equipment and I go to people's homes as much as I can. Um, I do it outside. And we have that luxury at the moment in California. So um, I am in a mask. I am mostly in a shield most of the time. Um, I don't use gloves. That's a medical decision. I don't think gloves are any better than skin unless you have open, you know, you gotta wash, you just gotta wash your hands. Um, I have, um, I wipe all materials sort of just as I use them, I just, you know, manipulatives, I just wipe them. And then what I do is I store them for a week um, before I use them again. So I have a couple of sets of the materials. And um, the children um, who are, uh, I see babies, so they're not masked. Um, I see toddlers and preschoolers, they're masked part of the time. And then probably by age five, I, I find that the children are pretty good at keeping masks on. So I would say it's, um, in terms of safety, it's it feels comfortable enough to me. My assessments are done outside for the most part, um, in people's backyards, on people's decks. I have an office space in Santa Monica with, uh, belonging to a speech therapist who has an out has developed an outside office, and so um, a covered outside office. So I will use that space if I have a family who doesn't have a space for me. And um, I, so I do all of the testing that I need to do face-to-face. I do that outside, in, in person, um, masked and shielded. Um, I will say one thing. I do a lot of assessments for children with autism. And so that's tricky. You just have to be in person. And it's very difficult. I think that's been the biggest challenge for me because while um, I need to see facial expressions and they need to see my facial expressions and um, it's hard to do with masks. And so for those children where I am asked to assess uh, for autism and especially in the little ones, two, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, I will do, um, and I do this across the board, I'll do my uh, remote testing first so that I can, even if it's on a screen, we can chat, we can, they can show me things in their room and we can, um, we can try to have as much interaction as possible so that I can see how the child is in terms of social communication. Because when I go out to the house, they may have their mask off, but I still have my mask on when I go out to see them um, at their homes. Um, and I would say that um, because, again, I'm a zero to six-year-old specialist, it's been particularly challenging for that age group. So I would say I've probably stretched that hybrid model um, pretty far and had to develop enough confidence in um, our safety measures to be able to go out and um, and test children, you know, in their in their homes. So I, I haven't done any, I'm not bringing anybody inside though. So I'm balancing safety, <laughs> going to them, but I'm not bringing them into my office. Yeah. So I wanna make sure we have time for questions. And so I'll, I'll leave it at that. I think you're muted. Mm-hmm. Ah, thank you, Sherry, for having oh, yeah. me. <laughs> so um, just uh, thank you very much, Dr. Gottlieb, for sharing that. And um, 
as Dr. Klonska has said, if you live by Zoom, you die by Zoom. And so unfortunately, while well, it's not Zoom, uh, Dr. Delmonica will not be able to join us today. Um, we decided that we will go ahead and maybe schedule a follow-up for him to present regarding um, this, this uh, topic working from a large hospital institutional setting. So that gives us a little bit more time also, I think. Um, so why don't we go ahead and I'm going to post some of the slides that I said I would earlier, and we can begin um, the dialogue amongst our presenters and answer questions that others in the participating audience have. So, uh, let me see here, let me get to my, Dr. Um, all righty. So I think um, everybody did uh, really talk about the hybrid model. So let's just bounce to some of the, um, the questions um, that the audience have. So um, what steps do you think would be helpful in training um, a caregiver or trainers to be facilitators for on-site remote administration of uh, obviously the WISCs and the Wyatts and other neuropsych tests or other tools you may be using? And just kind of open it up to the panel to have a dialogue. I, I might jump in and say it's a great question because I think I do that, you know, every day. Most of the children I test because they're young, I do need a caregiver in the room. So I always opt um, to request the person who's the least invested in the outcome. So if it's not a, if it's I I I always if it's a, Somebody else in the home that's not a parent, that's, that's mm -hmm. ideal, if that's the case. Um, I Basically, the way I train them is I, I really train, I send out an email um, that kind of highlights what, what's necessary. Um, mm -hmm. I make sure the child is set up. Um, materials that go to them are in a sealed uh, envelope. Um, so the response booklet for the Y, the coding booklet for the um, mm -hmm. WISC are sealed, are not opened until um, they arrive and then they're sent back after. I get uh, pictures or screenshots. I get screenshots of them so I can, um, you know, uh, properly score those measures that are sent out. And I really just have a parent or a care caregiver there um, to sit next to the child to make sure that they can find the right page they're supposed to be on, to make sure that um, they are looking at the the proper screen, the proper portion of the screen. Sometimes kids will, in answering a question, will point, and I can't see them point. I mean, I can see them point, but I can't see what they're pointing at on the screen. So um, I'll have a parent or a caregiver say if it's A, B, C, or D, for example, on some of the items of the Wyatt. Um, and I make sure that the child has everything that they need, can find where they are. If I'm giving an instruction, I make sure the caregiver uh, gives the exact instruction that I'm giving. So I prep the caregivers for that to please don't elaborate on the directions, instructions, please don't offer any help. Often kids turn to their parents and say, can you help me? So I just make sure that the parents are instructed on not helping um, because I do treat a lot of young children. I'm used to having parents in my assessments anyway, just sitting back. Um, so just making sure that they are, if they're repeating instruction, they're repeating exactly what I'm saying. They're guiding a child on a screen. They're guiding a child in terms of materials in front of them to make sure that they are um, on the correct page and then manipulating the cameras if I need to. So if I need to see the child working, say on a coding, um, for example, on the whisk, then I, the camera is, uh, is positioned so that I can make sure and watch the child while they're working. So in those ways I use, and then of course to keep them seated, which is in trouble. So just make sure they stay seated and, and, uh, you know, and, um, the other thing that I do with my families is I'm always, I use, uh, in my office, I used to use these beautiful gems. So every time they finished a game, I gave them a gem, they collected them. If they collected a certain number, they could go and, you know, do something with them. So, um, so now I have parents keep track of like tally marks. So I'm not, you know, and I do send out the gems at the end of the, you know, when they do collect 10 gems or 20 gems, they get them in the mail. They love that. Um, but so I have parents keeping like a tally mark system for the little kids. So they can stay focused. Um, and, um, and of course, um, um, you know, I break it up into multiple sessions for the, especially the young ones, because they, 
they can't really do more than an hour on a Zoom at a time. So um, that's kind of how I prep the, um, the caregivers for testing. Dr. Coleman and Kleonsky? Yeah. Well, I have a few ideas. So I, I love what you're saying about uh, using the gems and giving them to the kids a little bit later. We've been exploring, because we work with older kids, could mm -hmm. we use some games, like we might in our office, uh, as an opportunity to do some things in between and sign up for a reward and play some games. So we've been looking, and again, I have one of my students working on this. There's a, there's a, there's a, a group called Jackbox Games that makes games specifically for Zoom. It's not so easy to play games on Zoom. You can use the whiteboard yeah. for a couple of things, but mm -hmm. Jackbox mm -hmm. Games actually makes games for this. So we haven't begun doing it yet, but we're thinking mm -hmm. about using, using some of those games. And again, they're online games. Uh, oftentimes, and, and, and from my perspective, Again, we, we're very interested in how can you use games, not just for fun or as a, as a break, but we use games in our LearningWorks Live programs as an opportunity to practice executive functioning skills. So we help the kids recognize when they, so we're, we're looking to select games that practice a skill like planning or memory and, and just talk to the kids about that. When, when, but we haven't, we haven't begun doing that part yet. In terms of the parents, again, we're working with slightly older kids. Uh, the, le the letter that I send, and again, I'm very happy to share that with anybody if they would like that, tells the parents a little bit, first of all, what do we mean by teleneuropsychology? What are we actually doing? So that they, they're sort of introduced to this. And we, and I, in, in the letter, the, in the short letter, the short version, at least I talk a little bit about the limitations. Uh, one of the things that I try to remind parents about is similar to what you're saying, which is don't help Okay, that we, you know, you, you need to be there to help keep the child focused. Maybe not necessarily seated. I don't. Some of the kids I work with are not going to stay seated. I don't care if they're, if they're doing it, but uh, you know, helping them to define the role that the parents will have, and also being clear with them that if they help their kids too much, they're going to skew the results, and that by skewing those results, it's really not going to help the kid. We, we're trying to get an accurate. Uh, an accurate measure of what can this child do in this setting. Now, it's a different kind of setting than in your office, but it's not that different from school. And you're not there to help your kid in school. You may know that the kid knows the answer to the question. And so anyway, we try to communicate as much of that in the letter. And then I try to have a little conversation with the parents, you know, for all the kids. I mean, one of the things that we do with, with all of our remote testing, <coughs> excuse me, except for the older teenagers, is we make sure that the parents are in the room at first. We talk to them, we make sure that the kid is situated and can do stuff. But for the, say the kids who are 10, 11, 12, who can kind of do most of this on their own, we don't, we don't really want the parent right there. We'd rather have the parent sort of with an earshot. So when I call them, they can do that. So those are some of the things that, that, that we've noticed about kind of working with the parents. Mm -hmm. We've had this issue about, uh, to working on the other end of the age spectrum because about uh, 10 years ago, my uh, wife and I developed a test that published it called the Memory Orientation Screening Test. It's a five minute test for dementia. And we brought out an iPad version. We brought out a variety of different versions of this, but we wanted to do something then that could be administered in the home. And we thought about instead of the most, which is the Memory Orientation Screening Test, doing the most for mom or dad so that adult children could basically administer with our direction and assistance a brief test that would give them an objective measure of whether or not they should be taking mom or dad at that point to the doctors to talk with them about diagnosis and starting them on medications, for example, or making other kind of plans. And to be honest, this has sort of accelerated in a way, crazy kind of way, this whole process with the COVID adaptation has accelerated our thinking on this because now it's become a much more common thing. But we've also thought about you know, setting out some of the stimuli ahead of time. Uh, we were worried because most people wouldn't have computers. Well, there's a lot more people walking around with laptops now because they're using it for their kids' you know, classes and they could use this to administer a test. So it's been a very interesting thing. And uh, still a lot of hurdles to overcome as to how to avoid the biases. But I like your, your comment. Uh, Dr. Coleman, about, uh, you know, you got to get the objective data. If you start messing with it because you're trying to help the person, then you're only going to give us bad information. It's ultimately going to be to their disadvantage. 
Thank you for that. So clearly setting things up and coaching uh, other participants other than the examinee has really emerged as a critical component of all of this implementation. So some, some questions that are coming uh, from our current uh, participants in the audience is I thought maybe we could hit on. Uh, it, this is really a two-part question, and uh, it involves the copyright reproduction issues related to scanning and you know not scanning and uh, digitizing uh, proprietary materials. Um, even, uh, if the expressed purpose is for just administration. And the second part is challenges to the face-to-face -face derived psychometrics, underpinnings upon which most of these measures, norms, and scoring criteria have been developed. So I just, um, just as a caveat to that is just I want to make our participants aware that we, uh, Pearson, have been providing a lot of documentation regarding uh, proprietary stuff and what you can do and so on. But let's uh, open it up to the panelists and kind of how you've uh, addressed this. <laughs> Great question, and also I'm glad it's an asked question because we've struggled with this on our own end. I believe, and I'm not a lawyer, obviously, but I believe there's an issue of fair use. I've paid for these tests. They're my materials. I have a separate set of tests for each of the labs that I use. If I then scan them into a slide presentation that I'm giving in my office to a patient in that lab, I believe that's a fair use of the test. Now. I would love to have that sent to me because I've already bought the test by the test manufacturer saying, here it is, use this. And I'd say, great, this is wonderful. You've saved me a fair amount of time and heartache, and I don't have to worry that I'm somehow skirting a copyright law. But I don't know where this stands at this point from a legal perspective. Uh, so that, that's one issue. And the second part of it, from my perspective, in terms of how similar is this Back about six years ago, we did a study looking at a digitized version of that memory orientation screening test versus the paper and pencil version. We used a counterbalanced design, gave the test twice within an hour of it the first and second time. And much to our amazement, I published this in the uh, Clinical Neuropsychologist, much to our amazement, there was no practice effect. We got equivalent results Almost every one of the scores was within a point of the original score. And when we looked at first versus the second presentation, regardless of which one we gave first, half of the second ones were a point or two higher. Half of the second ones were a point or two lower if they were different from the original score. I'm betting that we're going to see very equivalent kinds of scores for the on-screen presentation, simply because the stimuli are robust. And the other question is, if they're not that robust, if you get a lot of difference, what are we truly measuring becomes the question. How, what's the ecological validity? So I like to use things which are reliable enough and robust enough that I think they're going to translate into what goes on in the real world. Thank you, Dr. Kulinski. Dr. Cohen? So I have a couple of thoughts about this. I, I like you, am not sure of the legal implications of things. We've done things like screened in a few uh, of the images from the Roberts apperception test, which I bought, the fanatic apperception test, which I bought, and use those online because that was a test that I thought, okay, we can do this online. I could, in fact, showing the images online may be better. We, we've we actually, using, using that theory, if you will, we uh, are now administering when we're doing it, we're doing some of this stuff in the in house with kids doing the Peabody and the expression vocabulary test, but we're actually doing it on the computer next to the kid because the images we have are better than our booklets, and then and 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 switching from from screen to screen is better. So, and I don't have any great data on that uh, as to how valid that is either. But the other piece that I would raise is this: is we don't have any data on what it's like to do testing with kids in an office wearing masks during a pandemic. Uh, when, those, when I see those kids come into my office and I see what their eyes look like and the stress and the anxiety that they're experiencing, and when we and then when we're trying to communicate through our masks and in, in that setting, I, what I, what I ended up feeling, and, and okay, I don't have any data for this, but what I ended up feeling, and like you, I kind of feel like, you know, I use robust tests that are, that are well, you know, that are well-researched, but my sense is that the choices that we're making right now in terms of which ones we do remotely versus which ones we do in-house, uh, they're equally as valid. Okay? But I think that there's we're, we're maybe we're missing a little bit right now that, 
than we might have been than we might have had in the past. But I really question sort of what it's like for these kids to, to be in that office. And the first thing they're doing is sanitizing their hands and they and I'm having to tell them to put their mask up and we're and I'm saying, okay, let's sit as far as we can across the table and and, and all those things that and in and we're not doing nearly as much as many practices are. I mean, like your practices and, and, and some of the, and, and some other and other practices as well. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll just just make one comment, which is that um, I would love for everything to be available on the screen <laughs> so that we can screen share and do the Whipsy and do can't really do the Bailey on a screen, but there are certainly other, you know, again, just because I, and, you know, and, and things like the Nepsy or things, you know, I feel like, I hope that we will have more and more and more available, um, particularly if we've purchased the materials and we own them and we can use them on our computer screen, that, that would be um, extraordinarily helpful because I think this is something where I don't think we're um, gonna be out of this pandemic tomorrow. So I think this is going to be a reality and there will be a new reality to this. I think it will change how we all do work. Certainly in medicine, we are uh, the physicians I work with, it's all very clear to all of us that we aren't going go to go back 100%. People, patients are really responding to telemedicine. Um, in terms of validity, I will say I agree. I mean, we don't, there's no benchmark for, there's no measure. We are in an unprecedented time. So these are, we have to utilize materials in the way that we can most help the children for the, you know, for the information we need. And I will say that in California, and I have a license in New York as well, so I do um, evaluate children in New York as well. Um, the school districts have actually approached me and contracted me to test for them for IEPs, which they never did before, you know, because they had, uh, you know, they're testers. And so, but they don't have a lot of testers who are able to to do this work remotely or their uh, testers aren't, aren't going out to the home. So in terms of validity, at least in California, the school districts seem to feel confident enough in the way I test. What I do do is um, obviously for anything that needs manipulatives, I go out and for the things that don't, and they've been, um, they've taken in the information and it's been valid enough for the districts to implement IEPs and accommodation. So. And, and provide service. So I think that's a good sign. Thank you for that. And so just to kind of bring this back around, I just wanted to alert folks that on the, the Pearson website that we have a series of documents that um, speak to some of the equivalency work that's been done uh, that you referenced um, uh, with some of our tools. Also, uh, the whole harmless uh, documents regarding image capture and what you can and can't do and whatnot, um, just to uh, for copyright and that kind of stuff. So. So those are all available for folks to reference at your leisure. Um, so here's a question that came before the actual presentation um, uh, from our, for folks. Um, could you speak to maybe third parties uh, not accepting online testing due to standardization or other issues and the ethical potential, or potentially legal fallout from that? Has there been anybody had any experience with that yet? No barriers? Um, I have not at this point, so um, okay. it hasn't been an issue for me. I, mo most of my work is done uh, at the request of pediatricians and clinicians, okay. so that's not an issue. Okay. I haven't run into more? any barriers either, no. Okay. So, all right. Well, that's good to know. Uh, so this is a question that's come up uh, uh, a few times in some of the um, some of the participants, and so I think it's definitely something that uh, we should dive into is the whole use of uh, block designs and manipulatives, and and you know we have on, on our end have uh, put out some accommodations and uh, things that folks can do as alternatives. But I'd be curious to hear how you have tackled this, uh, measuring processing speed, block design, and these types of uh, you know for. Um, visual processing skills and so on. If you can let us share your experiences, it'd be great. In my model, we just have the block sort of like a candy uh, jar. It sort of sits there on the desk and it's already there. And we put up a stimuli and we have embedded videos with that we've taken videos of somebody manipulating them with a voiceover. So it's just as if we were sitting in the room, except it's on the screen. 
So it's pretty close to that. I don't know how you would do that on somebody at home. Uh, same way with uh, we're doing, you know, paper and pencil things with coding. We also use the oral SDMT. So again, you just look at the screen and you, it's got the sheet there, it's laminated. People just read out the items. Uh, so it's workarounds, but at least, you know, it's, it's a much more difficult material management, I think, if you're out. Same way uh, we use uh, some computerized tests. So we have a program called Splashtop that allows us to take control of the computer, it's the second computer in the office, to administer a Wisconsin card sorting test on computer, uh, paste auditory serial addition test. So it's a question of how much control can you exercise in what kind of setting? Okay. When I do any, when I, I'm administering materials that require manipulatives, so for the, you know, I mentioned for the, for the Whipsy and Bailey as examples, or the, um, those are where, that this is where I choose to do the in-home or, or the, you know, direct face-to-face. -face. Um, I've had a lot of success using the WISC integrated um, option in order to um, get a non-motor IQ for the WISC, which um, again, school districts are accepting without difficulty. Um, and so that's a remote, that's a remote administered block design test. Um, coding, uh, coding and processing speed tests, again, I send that out and uh, I get a screenshot of it and they send it back. So they are doing that pencil and paper as I am watching them with a camera. Um, as I am, as they're doing other materials, say from the Wyatt, um, I'm watching them as they do the the coding. It's it's um, it's a little tricky just because I I need to time and the and the person on the other end needs to time as well um, because it is timed and you do sometimes get a funny glitch here or there um, on the on the um, you know the the. Uh, internet just speed. So um, even though I have a, you know, as quick as one as I can get, um, sometimes you get a funny glitch. So that's where you have to really make sure it's also being timed on the other end. So my experience has been uh, similar to, to yours in the sense that we try, we're trying to do a hybrid model. And so for the most part, though, when, you know, with, with the, with the, uh, test pack that you mentioned, block design, symbol search, coding. We're just doing them in the office. Where you know, this is, a, you know, trying to sort of cut the probabilities, if you will, cut, cut the risk by spending less time in the office and doing the best we can to make that office experience safe. And again, we're going through the same process that that most practices are in terms of having people wait in their cars, not having any sit in the waiting room, or, or at most having one family sit in the waiting room. So. But anything that involves manipulatives, we're doing that. There's a couple of computerized tests that we are also doing in the office as well. So at that point, we have plenty of space. Uh, our offices are, are quite large, so we're, we're, I'm, I'm at home now. But, but I happen to be in, a, in an old historic building, and our offices are probably all like three to 400 square feet at least. So we have some space to kind of spread out. It's not a, a, close, not a close space. But, we'll, for example, we'll do the, the, the CPT there, the, the tech. Uh, so we're, do, we, we're doing those computerized tests that at this point, as far as I know, are not available to do online. Thank you. So just uh, there's a series of questions that have come up from um, participants that um, they are asking for your willingness to share some of the materials you've developed that you've referenced. And um, after the presentation, we will basically have a, a list of the queries that we will be able to send and um, to the off to the presenters, and uh, you guys can respond as you see appropriate given what's what you're comfortable with. So just for folks out there listening, okay. Um, how about the, someone had asked about who does high stakes evaluations, um, and they were curious about legal challenges uh, related to that, and why maybe the trust disagrees with doing testing remotely. Um, and I, I would think that high stakes may be perhaps forensic evaluations or perhaps custody evaluations and these types. So I don't know if you mm -hmm. get into those or maybe even social security disability evaluations and whatnot. So 
you have um, anything to add around that? Well, in my world, high stakes evaluations, which are typically forensic, uh, both criminal and civil, always have questions because there's always something that someone can bring up that you could have done differently, should have done differently, may have done differently. It's just a different brand. You know, we've dealt with the whole issues of what about third party observers? Could somebody tape this? There's position papers on this. Somehow we've forgotten that most of the training that everyone gets in neuropsychology has a third party observer. Oops, forgot about that. There's always students sitting around, somebody tuning in. Suddenly, oh, how does this change the dynamics? So I'm, I'm sort of used to this coming up. And if you do it with masks on, whether well, someone's going to challenge, well, you have masks on. If you do it without masks on, well, they'll challenge that too. So I think it's just a different, you know, old wine and new bottles kind of approach. And if you're pretty clear on why you do what you do, and you're trying to assure the most fidelity to the evaluation you do, I think that by and large, it's going to be acceptable. I'm sure there's somebody on the other end who will challenge it. Just a question of, okay, here's why I do it. This is, I've thought about these issues and I planned ahead. I built these checks and therefore I stay at the same question we always have to ask as an ethical psychologist, which is what's the validity of what you've done and did you do it for good reason? So that's where I am on that issue at least. But I'd love to hear from my colleagues. So I haven't had um, any um, anybody asking me at this point for, or, or being concerned about high stakes evaluation. And I, and I would sort of find myself in the same position that you are, which is to say, well, I do this in a very thoughtful manner. I've considered all of these different aspects of it, and this is the best that we can do. Uh, I'm sure, as you're saying, it's easy to challenge, and we can challenge ourselves. I mean, I think that you know, any of us who, who are going to do good work are going to say, well, how can I do this better? How can we do all of our work better? How could, the, how could this test be better for that matter? But I, I think mm -hmm. that that's what you can do. Uh, fortunately, I haven't seen those challenges. In fact, if anything, I would say that the overall attitude that I'm experiencing, at least with patients and other professionals, has been, oh, well, glad you're still doing this. We're glad you haven't kind of crawled into a hole and stopped because mm -hmm. of this. And so, you know, now those aren't lawyers, mind you. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I, don't know, I, don't any, I don't know if there's any lawyer psychologists listening, but, uh, you know, you know my, they're not lawyers, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, those are people who, 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 who are appreciative of what you're trying to do and do that. But I'm, I'm sure that if, 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 if an attorney wants to kind of run you over the coals for this, they'll figure out a way to do it. Yeah, and I, I, I do, I don't know if they would be considered high stakes, but I certainly see a lot of young children and I certainly um, spend a significant amount of time um, speaking to custody. So um, I think what my approach is, is what it's always been, but maybe beefed up a little bit in that I'll just make sure that I document anything that's different. You know, we were wearing masks. This is how I did this. I spent this amount of time without masks. So I'm just making sure that I'm documenting anything that might be relevant and have an impact. And the other thing is I just spend a lot of time ensuring that I have a lot of collateral information. So um, if there's anything that I feel um, could be challenged related to generation of data, I just make sure that I get information from everybody that could potentially be involved even above and beyond what I would normally do. Um, just so that should it be challenged? I haven't been challenged yet by lawyers um, so far, knock on wood. So um, I think it's I think it's just that we we need to do our very best, gain as much information, grab as much information as we can to support our findings and make sure that we are very transparent about how we approach the task. So we can kind of combine these, I think, two questions um, from the audience uh, is, uh, can you comment on administration, uh, hybrid administration, and how you would structure administration of the, the 10 subtests as the WISCs with, if you do the iPads, I don't know if you guys use the iPads for that for a Q interactive, uh, but even if you don't, um, do you tend to cluster all the manipulatives together so you can kind of get that done in a single sequence? Uh, or do you go based on the uh, 
um, the sequence that it was as presented and designed. Um, and similarly, how about uh, projective measures and uh, other tests like the uh, MAPI and so on? Yeah, I am. I mean, I guess um, uh, I don't. Uh, what I would say about the 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 whisk again, I I either use the um, the ten subtests using the whisk integrated um, multiple choice block design and sending out the coding. And symbol search, so that covers, um, and the other eight um, or seven subtests are all are all able to be administered on screen. I think I get I get um, caught up with the whipsy because I can't do that with the whipsy. Mm -hmm. um, and otherwise, I um, I don't necessarily do them in order. I collect all of my manipulative driven. Um, tests modules, and I bring them when I do my usually my second session after my first online session, and do all my ma manipulative um, work um, at one time. So I don't do them in order if I'm just collecting my kind of, you know, outside house call kind of manipulative driven, you know, testing session. Yeah, I would say I, we're not doing some of them in order. And at one point, and because we're doing the manipulatives in the office and, and the other testing online, and I had some concerns and questions about that, like not doing it quite in the order and not doing all 10 subtests at a time. And I talked to one of my colleagues who works on my staff, who's a school psychologist, and says, who said, well, you know, a lot of times when we're doing testing at school, we don't have time to do the whole list. So we'll do four or five tests, and then we'll do another three, and that we'll have to divide it like that. That's just how it works. Well. So I, I'm not sure that it's, I, I, you know, I, I, I recognize that there's, there's not data about doing it this way, but I would say that under the circumstances, if we're collecting as much data and as much information as we can, we're doing the best job we can in these circumstances. So that's mm -hmm. been sort of our approach to it. And, uh, I'm just told that that's really a bad idea, that we'll, we'll keep doing it. <laughs> I think that's quoting the great... Dr. Rolling Stones, which is you can't always get what you want, but sometimes you get what you need. <laughs> That's right. So, um, you know, I think there are there is information about um, creating kind of customized batteries and whatnot. I know that we've uh, done some of that with our Q Interactive platforms um, and done some of the preliminary research uh, behind that when that was constructed. But so there is information out there on this and. Um, not enough time today to kind of go down that rabbit hole, but uh, we have about a, a minute and a half left. And, you know, this has been a very rich presentation and I really appreciate all the wisdom that you've shared with us. Um, uh, clearly doing uh, remote testing, hybrid testing, COVID adaptive testing has some heavy lifting on the front end to get it going. But that seems like once you get through, once you get your sea legs, there's uh, a lot you can do. So any final uh, 20 second comments anybody wants to say before we wrap this up? Help us out, Pearson. <laughs> we're, we're trying. <laughs> We are trying. Uh, we are trying. All right. With that, why don't we call it uh, an afternoon and uh, everybody enjoy the rest of your day. And thank you uh, for uh, participating as panelists and as participants in the audience. Thank Take you. care. Bye -bye. Thank you.